right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Entrepreneur Hour. I've got, and, and I meant to ask you before we started, because I've been trying, we always have guests that come on the show, and usually beforehand, I make sure that I can pronounce their name appropriately. Right, I'm right. Gonna, I'm going to get to that in a second, but we have some interesting, interesting things we want to talk about. I know we've had guests on before, and I told you this, uh, that we've talked about blockchain, the application thereof. We're going to talk about pitch practice. Uh, we're going to talk about how to overcome failures. There's a lot of things that we want to talk about today. But Mr. Sam, do you go by Sam or Sammy? I've seen it twice. Absolutely. Good question. Most people in America call me Sam. In Europe, they call me Sammy because that's my full name. So Got Sam it. is And the last name, I'm going to try before you tell me what it is. Yes. Rusani. Oh, perfect. You nailed it. Sam Rusani. All right, man. Welcome to the show, buddy. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. And that is totally a blunder. I've done 200 of these. And I always ask before how to pronounce somebody's name. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I gave you the countdown and I started recording. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't ask him how to pronounce oh, it. Oh, that's all good, man. It's all good. You but know. hey, we knocked it out of the park. I could have got it anyways. And it would have been yes. unbeknownst to anybody. Exactly. We'll keep it in real here. So Sweet, man. Well, hey, you and I were chatting before we started recording. And I think there's some really cool stuff that we can talk about and share with our audience. You've had yep. some tremendous experiences as an entrepreneur, both, it sounds like both the highs and the lows and everything in between, which is anybody that's been in entrepreneurship and has leveled up, they know that's the experience, right? No matter how successful yep. you are, you probably experience lows that will equate to those highs, right? Or at least- Absolutely. Right? I think that's part of the story and part of the journey. And I think sometimes there's a lot of people that looking from the outside, looking in, or looking from a lower totem pole, part of the totem mm -hmm. pole, right? In terms of people that they admire and respect, I think that they just think that they've been immune from failures, right? Or they've been immune from these struggles or they've gotten to a plateau where like, that's no longer a part of their life or no longer part of their reality, right? And I, right, right. my experience, and I'm sure it is with yours, is like, that's not the case, right? Like things definitely get a little bit easier in terms of, you know, some, there, it's different problems, right? It's different problems than you experience with the early, early stages. But Anyways, yeah. I want to hand you the mic. Uh, we're going to get into that and so much more. I just want to kind of tease yes. about what we're going to talk about here today. Yep. But Sam, tell me, man, who are you? What do you do? And how'd you start doing it? Oh, that's a loaded question right there. It is. Uh, <laughs> you got 30 minutes. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. Uh, great opportunity here. I'm super excited about it. And uh, Sam Rosani, I'm the current CRO, Chief Revenue Officer of ShipChain software company focused on disrupting the uh, massive, massive transport and logistics industry. But I come from um, owning an agency, Inc. 500 listed agency, worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, and, you know, born and raised in Sweden. So tiny, tiny town, 25,000 people or so. Um, and, What's your uh, accent, bro? I don't hear it at all. Right, right. I, I worked on it, you know, because I didn't, you know, I worked with American clients and we can go into that in Sweden too, but, or bands. But uh, yeah, I didn't want to come to America and be like, hello, yeah, I'm on the boat. <laughs> so, and I, I'm, I, well, you know, that was good. And all my Swedish friends are going to be like, you mother. Yeah, you uh, sold but, out. You yeah, sold yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but you know, to me, it's always been about wherever I go, I make an effort to learn the language learn the customs and the traditions and you know learn that language in a correct way if i'm in, in spain i learn spanish how they speak spanish if i'm in wherever you know i'll learn rome chinese Literally. or Literally. italian or yeah it doesn't matter where i go but I, I try to the best of my extent to respect the language and the culture and you know i i celebrate all the american holidays and <laughs> you know i Try to sound like an American as well, because this is where I live. This is, the, you know, this is where I built my life and my career and all that. So you're doing well, and I and I totally yes, just derailed your thought process. I apologize. Oh no, you're good, man. You're good. Anyway, so uh, please continue. So yeah, from a from a tiny town, uh, jumped on the banana boat and ended up here, right? Uh, mm. <laughs> no, actually, flew here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for clarifying. <laughs> uh, and yeah, just just I think. You know what's been what's been kind of uh, always a part of my journey is I've always been interested in innovation and I've always been interested in doing things not like other people are doing mm. them, right? because I had I've been an entrepreneur all my life and it, the the journey really started because I worked a summer in a in a meat packing factory right so one summer like three months I was packing sausages and all kinds of stuff into boxes and I just thought to myself. I'm never going right. to do this again. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't ever want to have a boss. I don't want to work for someone. 
Uh, it's just ne never happening again. So that's what triggered it all. And here we are, I'm, I'm in LA, it's, you know, 14, 15 years now and uh, working with technology. And like I said, through that journey, it's been a lot of entertainment industry, music, uh, big brand agencies, et cetera. So. Now, did you come flying out of the gates with your entrepreneurship efforts or because I know I, I was teasing earlier about having some ups and downs and stuff like that. And I would think coming from another country, having to learn the culture, that's a huge radical change. I experienced that with my wife, you know, her being uh, from Puerto Rico and coming mm -hmm. and it's, it's not only like having to start a business, but it's learning a business in a language that isn't your native language. Right. So it's this entirely it's like adapting to the culture. And here's the thing, too. Maybe you experienced this. But specifically with marketing, mm -hmm. I have a deeply rooted understanding of the American culture and the American consumer because I grew up here. I yeah. live here. I've lived mm -hmm. here my entire life, right? right? So I kind of understand at a deep level, right, mm -hmm. what Americans want, uh, what motivates them to buy. So as a revenue officer, right, somebody who is in charge of kind of guiding, obviously that's not marketing, it's a tad bit different, right? But understanding and communicating uh, in a B2B capacity, which I assume that's what you do now, right? And or at least you've mm -hmm. done throughout your your you know entrepreneurial career. Maybe you've done both. Yep. Um, I have. Sounds like you have. Yep. <laughs> How much of a challenge has that been for you, not just the entrepreneurship side, but also the culture changing side as well? See, that's a very good question because I, you know, you would think that, okay, I'm from Sweden, uh, mandatory you know, we all speak English, so, you know, mm. any 10 year old you meet in Sweden, they're going to speak English, right? Because it's our that. second language, right? Uh, so you'd think, you know, Western, very developed society, all that, and just going to America would be the same thing. But it was a massive culture clash, just mm. because it's, it's very, very different in the mindset. And, and, and I love the American mindset, right? That was the weather, of course, but also the mindset of people <laughs> is really why I love moving here and, and saw the opportunities here. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you got to learn, like you said, I, I wasn't really, when you come here, I mean, we get a lot of American culture in Europe and Sweden, you know, Simpsons and friends and like all these TV shows and movies and mm. all that stuff. But when you are here, you, you have to learn, you know, there's a lot of slang idioms, um, uh, a lot of, uh, nonverbal communication that might not be completely the same. Um, how people speak and act and what they do is not really the same. And, and the system just, you know, getting an apartment, paying the bills is like, what the hell is going on? Credit so score. Totally what different. The hell is that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so it was a learning phase. It took a couple of years to kind of get really adapted to it. But like I said, I immersed myself. I didn't move yeah. where all the other Swedes live. I don't, I didn't move. Do you see what I mean? I just, yeah. Hey, I'm in America. I'm going to become an American and, and I just got to learn it. So if I don't know what something means, I'll just ask. Which is nuts, man, because I've seen people that have come here and here being U.S. Um, and they don't speak the language. And what they've done is they just move where other people that are from their culture, right, or from their country go. And, and one of the things I've noticed is it kind of like it's, it's, it stagnates their growth. Right. Absolutely. Like, so like they've been here a decade and they don't speak a lick of the language yeah. at all. Like they can't even get by. They can't even go to the grocery store, yeah. and get, go get gas. Like it's really, yeah. really bad. So yeah. I yeah. would think that there's a degree of not losing sight of your identity and, and, and of your cultural roots, but then also still wanting to mesh in with the society that you currently live. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> to me, it's I guess maybe if you're, you know, I think it's all mindset. And, and which mindset do you come from and what mindset have you learned throughout life, right? Because sure. I, sh I don't share my mindset with my parents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think maybe if you're 80 years old and you move to a new country, it might be hard. But I, I don't think really it's – it's kind of a loaded question, but, and, and I might have some strong opinions. But, but I don't think – to, to me, there's no excuse for not going out and getting acquainted with where you live. Respect the, the country, respect the language, respect the, the customs, respect the people, the mm. law, all that stuff. Um, 
I, I don't care what's legal back in Sweden. If it's, if it's not legal here, then I'm not going to do it. Like, do you see what I mean? And you can, I believe in mixing cultures. That's one of the reasons I love LA. It's, it's a big melting pot of just yeah. tons of different cultures. You want Ethiopian culture and food, you go to, mm. you know, you go down to Fairfax, you want Spanish, you want Portuguese, you want Chinese, Japanese, whatever you want. It's all here. And I love it. I love visiting different cultures. I love learning about cultures, but I don't think there is any excuse for not, immersing yourself and integrating yourself to me it's like i always you know uh, my mindset has always been if, if i w if i want respect in my house right if you yeah. come to my house you follow my rules sure yes. it doesn't matter what the world outside is like you follow mm -hmm. my rules in my house so if i have that mindset well the, i gotta follow your rules i'm if i'm in your house right otherwise it's, it just falls apart so that's i'm in america's house now and i follow the rules of america that's just how it is. And I mean, I'm, I've been here so long now. I mean, this is a country I would, somebody tried to come in and take our shit here. I would fucking, you know, excuse me, but I would, I would defend it. You know, yeah, this is, yeah. this is my life. This is my country now. You know, yeah. it's just, that's just how it is. Interesting. Now here's, um, because I was curious about how that affected you in business. Right. But here's the thing. I would maybe think, and this is kind of just flipping a paradigm on its head here. There are some things that possibly we take, we being like, you know, native, um, not native Americans, yeah. like native yeah. of America. Yeah. Native yeah. United States. Um, I've never said it that way where it comes <laughs> out. Yeah. Anyways, me yeah. being some don't, don't get a tweet storm. A naturalized there. citizen, right? No, no, that would assume that I, I became natural. I'm just yeah. getting further away here. Right, Somebody right. One American United citizen. States. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, so, I here's the thing. I, I said that I just understand the culture, but here's the thing, man. You maybe notice things that are different because you're not from here, right? So it maybe Absolutely. gives you the opportunity to market better than maybe what I do because I can't see between the lines anymore because it's Tunnel just kind of blurs together, right? Yep. So has that served you well in your marketing? Efforts? Absolutely. How have you reverse engineered that. Uh, absolutely, yes. Because there are certain aspects that I didn't, it didn't understand or still to this point don't understand. But I think that's natural also in a, in a big country like this where someone in LA doesn't really understand the mindset of someone in New York. Like, oh, they're just yeah. rude. And, you know, well, the New Yorkers like, oh, you lazy LAers. Like, it's just mindset, right? But, but I think it kind of forces you to really dig into and understand the, the, the demographic that you're trying to market or sell to, okay. right? And that's what you have to do. You have to understand people at the core level. That's the key or, or the, the curiosity to understand people is the key to all those things you mentioned in the beginning. You want to raise money? Understand who you're pitching to. You want to sell stuff? Understand your customer. You want to make a new friend? Understand that person. You want to date someone? Understand that person. Be curious about it. Do you see what I mean? But what does that look like for you in terms of practical application? Because people say that, know your market, understand your market, yeah. be able to empathize with them. Yes. What do you do that's intentional so that you can put yourself in the position to like, is it, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I recommend to people to go lurk in Facebook groups or to, to just communicate with people in, in, in private Facebook groups because you don't have to go anywhere. You can literally just sit in your computer and do that. So yep. from a practical standpoint, what are some things that you do to be able to assess your market, read your consumer and understand them on a deep level, understand the differences in culture between LA and New York and so on and so forth. How do you apply that to your life? So d depending on my mission here, right? If it's for sure. a personal purpose or if it's for a business purpose, if for a business purpose. For a business purpose is what I meant. Yeah. 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 So business uh, purpose, what I do is I try to, I always go, where does my demographic hang out? Okay. What problems do they have? I look at influencers or ambassadors of that demographic. I look at the, the news platforms that they read. I look at the language that's being used. I look at the questions that are being asked. You can look mm -hmm. in Quora, you can look in forums, you can look sure. everywhere, you can look on blogs, um, on comments. So there, there's a lot of ways to, just from your phone nowadays, do really extensive marketing. It's crazy. You can get free reports from PwC and, and Accenture and all these guys if you want like a big overview of a demographic. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's 99% there's internet and then actually just diving into the industry and, and asking. Like for, for ShipChain, for example, where I'm now, uh, 
I don't come from the transport and logistics industry. So how do I understand it? Well, I just okay. go out, conferences, meet with people, call up people, uh, lunches, dinners, I don't care what. And I ask, who are you? What do you do? Okay, what are the problems you're currently facing in this industry? Mm -hmm. What are you seeing? What, are, what do you think others are seeing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You just, you got to immerse yourself in it, mm -hmm. right? It's the same thing with like when we built our agency. So we got to understand our clients. And in many cases, all these brands um, are targeting wrong demographics. So they're not speaking to the demographic in the correct right. way. And you got to go in and talk to the demographic and understand how do they work. Now, you can also do that with, you know, you can split test ads and split test traffic, mm -hmm. running traffic, or you can just go out and speak to them with them. Yeah. And it's so tough, man, because part of the part of the beauty in what you just said is that we do have so much access to so much information. Yeah. Right? The hard part is how do you reconcile or disseminate the information itself? Right. Because sometimes you get information and, and it's leading you down one path and you think this is the path that I've got a clear understanding of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you deploy that, it ends up not being exactly what you thought or you find information elsewhere that contradicts the data that you think you found that proves what your theory entailed. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, so, so how do you work through that and figuring out, okay, here's an aggregate of the data. Now here's how I break that down to figure out what it actually means. Cause that's, that's the next step that I feel like a lot of people get lost in. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of different ways of doing that, right? Okay. Either you can split test ads and you can split test running sure. traffic to your pages, et cetera, or you go out and again, you talk to them. That's okay. Again, that's what I do. I mean, physically sure. talk to them. Either you speak at a, you know, do a workshop, seminar, speaking engagement, or talk to people in that demographic within that line of work and go to a conference because there's a lot of people looking for solutions at a yeah. conference, right? What, what are you looking for? Why are you looking for that? Okay. What, how does a, you know, how does this problem present itself in your industry? Mm. Okay. Uh, and then get an understanding for, you know, again, what is it? And lurking Facebook groups? Fantastic. There are so many Facebook groups that are specialized crazy, yeah. to different industries and people vent on those Facebook groups. Yes. And, there and they you tell can... you how they actually feel way more than in person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or Absolutely. what they think they actually feel, which is sometimes right. cognitive dissonance. <laughs> they don't know how they actually feel exactly. about something, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Which is always right. a big challenge. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, the successful marketers, the successful salespeople, the successful entrepreneurs are the one that dig, they dig down more than one or two levels. They yes. dig all the way down, yes. right? Because yes. people nowadays, and it's another discussion, right? But they want the, it's a one click instant gratification society that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. I want it to be just, uh, you know, this person looks great, let's run some traffic or whatever. And that's where you're not successful. Sometimes you might hit it right. You uh, score right, right? But, but the marketers, entrepreneurs, salespeople that are consistently successful in what they do, mm -hmm. one, are not afraid of failing. That's the most important thing, right? But two, they do their research and then they apply and execute, right? Because mm -hmm. you have a lot of people getting stuck in analysis paralysis as well, right? Yes. They study and study and study and study and they could be, a, you know, get a PhD and whatever, but yeah, apply it, you know, that's what you got to do. And that's okay. So that's the, t that's the tough thing. And I know it's case by case. I know I'm asking you really difficult questions in terms of answering in generalities. Right. But I see this oh, way too often. And I've tried to like come up with something that's has some form of universality, right. Where I can say like, here's what I would do contingent upon you know, an outlying situation, right? Mm -hmm. Like here's the basic methodology that I would give somebody, but I would first glean information from online, right? Get involved with those communities, have discussions because you can do that at mass, right? You can do that at scale, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Take that and do what you just said, which is take that information to the offline world, have real conversations as a follow-up measurement, right? Yes. Figure out like, okay, and this is the mistake that I see people make and I want to see if you agree with this. They take the, they either they skip step A, which is gl glean as much information as you can online, or oh, yeah. they repeat said conversations in the real world without digging a layer deeper. Exactly. It's a continuation of the same yes. conversation. Yes. Right? You they need just to, that. to make sure they're right. Right. Which is not bad, right? I can see the, the, I can see the merit in that. But I think 
taking sure. that and being able to further distinguish what the online audience meant by A or B and then testing that at a deeper level with an in-person setting is probably more effective util utilization of time, no? Absolutely, and I, I totally agree with you. I think there's, there's two things in play here as well that I would like to add to what you already said, which I agree with, is that the layer one guys are the guys that listen to reply. Okay. The layer two guys are the guys that listen to understand. Mm. Big difference. Huge difference. <clears throat> Very big difference. Um, and the second one is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it also goes into the research that you do. Is something I've been preaching for a long time, and I didn't coin the, the, the concept or create the concept. It's created by way smarter people than me. But uh, if you ever heard of the 1990 model? Mm -mm. Now, the 1990 model is usually described as this is how you sell on the internet. Mm -hmm. But you can apply this model on thousands of years of history of selling. So mm -hmm. you have the 1% which are the, the content creators, right? Mm -hmm. The brand mm -hmm. or the personal brand or the product, right? You have the 9% of users on the internet in this case that are the content aggregators, which might be a news platform. It might sure. be an ambassador slash influencers, whatever. Three and the 90, you have the consumers. Now, the big mistake a lot of people are doing is they go from one trying to attract the 90. That's like going knocking on doors. You see what I mean? I, I try know. to understand the 90. No. Find the nine. Because it's the difference between a guy walking up that you don't know, walking up to you on the street saying, listen to my CD. I don't know about you, but I'm going to say no. Mm. And, and, you know, 99 out of 100 times. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know you. I don't have time. I got all the shit to do, right? But if a good friend gives you a CD, hey, listen to this. This is a really good CD. Of course I'm going to listen. Mm. Same thing here. Those are the nine, the influencers, the ambassadors, whatever you want to call it. So what you really need to do to have an effective marketing strategy is to find those niners, the 9%, and really understand, uh, you need to understand the problems of the 90, but you need to communicate the solution through the nine. You see what I mean? You need to aggregate whatever information you have through the nine, because those are the friends handing you a CD telling you it's a good track. So right. those are, you know, so listen to understand and not to reply and then understand like a one nine ninety model, right? Like so, we did. Oh, so give me, an give me an example of what you would do, right? I'm, I, I like practical advice. So mm -hmm. if, let's say you're starting something out and you want to speak to the nines, right? What, what are the next steps that you would do in the real world to be able to communicate that to somebody in the nines? So, I would, I, would, I would figure out like who's my demographic and who do they listen to, right? So okay. the demographic is the 90. So you need okay. to understand who right. that is. Then I would figure out, okay, where do they, what do they read and where do they read it? Okay. Very important. So if they read Forbes, well, I'm going to target Forbes for my Got news it. outlet, right? If they meet, read Men's Health or whatever, I'm going to target those. As for influencers, I'm going to have to see who is speaking to my demographic. Got so. It. I look at a bunch of people that has a uh, you know good following but also good engagement and see do they talk about the challenges that my demographic has do they talk about the problems do they talk do they present you know are they open to presenting a solution mm -hmm. etc but but you got to figure out uh who is the nine who is the ambassador because if you're not you got to find somebody that is okay. you know and and, and, and just, just to add to this, yes, please. This, this goes into any scope. And here's the interesting thing, right? So uh, let's take it from an internet. You have a product, you find yes. ambassadors or influencers. They sell in mean, the thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of products uh, online. Yeah. But you can take it into a small, small room. If you're doing a pitch meeting that somebody put together, right? I did this, uh, I talked about this a couple of years ago. We were in a pitch. One guy put together a pitch. There's a ton of influential guys in the room or mm -hmm. rich, rich people in the room. Mm -hmm. And we were pitching a project and I just explained this and they were all like, oh, wow. Oh yeah. I want to implement that in my business. Like, oh, and I'm like, no, 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 let's take it back to the room. And they're like, what do you mean? And I said, you know, let's say that the guy's name was Peter, whatever, who brought this all together. Mm -hmm. I said, let's look at this room. Who's the 1%? And they're like, oh, well, that's you, Sam. Yep. So who's the nine? Well, that's Peter because he got us all here. Who's the 90? And they all looked at each other like, what the hell? We're the 90? Like, mm. we're the, the, you know? And I'm like, yeah, this is how it works. And this is how human psychology works. So is that kind of like a- marketing. Is that kind of like, so there's a couple different concepts that I'm thinking about. So Seth Godin talks about minimum viable market. Yep. Right. But then also, um, 
Charles Duhigg talks about uh, the, the, the pressure or the power of strong and weak ties. So the nine effectively are weak ties because, mm-hmm. because the nine is influencing the other people to buy into that through association with you, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that makes total sense. Now, how do you, so my question therein was, how do you get someone in the nines if you are a startup and you don't have a portfolio to build off of and you're just getting this thing off the ground? Mm -hmm. How do you identify someone that is a good nine, quote Mm -hmm. unquote, for you to be able to kind of transcend or to convey a message to the 90? Uh, It's, again, going back to do your research, you know? Yeah, definitely. So the, the, again, the nine would would include what are the, the press platforms and the blogs or the radio stations, okay. or whatever. Like, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So primarily, it, well, it's gonna, and that's where it's tough because it's case by case, right? Because if it's a B two B play, it's going to be totally different than if you're selling Absolutely. an info product, right? Yes. Because Absolutely. you might put something on Medium to you know, or you might go guest on somebody else's, like you're doing with my show. If you were selling mm-hmm. a product, I could be right. the for your ninety. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, it is, so I get that. Like, I get that it's yep. tough to kind of say, that's why I was asking for to give an example. And I think your example is right. Great. Well, well, I think, you know, there, there, it's also about being smart about, because I, I see a lot of brands being dumb about uh-huh. being, finding the nines, right? Uh-huh. Let's take an example. And I don't, I don't want to bash anyone, but no, please do. <laughs> we'll, we'll take someone like Kim Kardashian, right? Yeah. Um, she has 140 something million followers or something, you know, mm-hmm. on Instagram or whatever it is. Right. Mm-hmm. And she charges a million dollars a post. Yeah. And let's say you have a beauty brand. Sure. Okay. So the problem here is you're asking Kim Kardashian to, you know, uh, again, I'm not bashing her. I'm just saying we're using her as an example. You're telling her to promote your post and you're paying a million bucks. To me, as a, uh, I would, I mean, you know, sorry for the self brag here, but I would consider myself a pretty smart marketer. I would say, no, you're being stupid. No, but she's got 140 million followers. This mm. is great. Sure. But 120 million of those, they just want to see tits and ass because that's how she came to be Dude, where she yeah. is at. Yeah. So you're paying for 120 million people that don't give a shit about your product, right? Yeah. Why don't you follow or figure out someone maybe from her followers or just someone different, someone who has 30K followers, but where there's thousands of those that oh, really man, are into geez. your organic skincare product or whatever the hell you're selling, right? Mm-hmm. And pay her 500 bucks or him 500 bucks. Do you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, totally. And that's where it's tough to give people advice about this stuff, man, because what you just said, it requires you to have some semblance of... I don't want to say common sense. That's not the right word, but like <laughs> rational thought process yes. and it's more of being a sleuth detective marketer, right? Yep. Because mm-hmm. most people surface, and like you said, like most marketers stay at, you know, the level one, the others dig deeper, right? Yes. So at first glance, seeing how many followers that she has, you're like, is it a win? Oh yeah. Like, oh, there, this... There's no way this couldn't work. Bling. Wow. Right. Shiny right. object syndrome. Like, woohoo. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a big issue, man, because I think, and this has really been promulgated by what I feel to be our social media society. And I talk about oh, this a lot. I, I almost got off Instagram just period a month yeah. or so ago because I get so frustrated with the vanity metrics, right? It's like, oh my God. I don't give a shit how many followers you have if no one's engaged with your stuff, right? If it's just followers for the sake of followers, that's not, those aren't people. Those are just numbers to you. Exactly. Exactly. And it's so easy to buy followers and it's so easy to, you know, um, to me, it's also Instagram is a show reel, right? You never see the failures on Instagram. You never see the mistakes that are being made. Sure. You never see the, the raw camera angles. Sure. You can have a, you know, no makeup photo or whatever, but it's, that's not, you know, if you're a, if you're a model with 8 million followers, you're, you're probably going to look good without makeup too. Like, you know, or you yeah. find your angles and your light and like, it's just, and I'm not bashing models here, but I'm just saying like, no. I totally agree with you. Yeah. You know? And I have such a love, hate with the platform. And I know that I need to be there because it is, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a fat, it's the fastest growing, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the fastest growing social media platform. I think that's probably obvious at this point. That or TikTok. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I know it's, I know it's one of those things where I need to be. I know that the engagement is ridiculous. We didn't see the CTRs there. Um, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I, but I, I'm, I'm redoubling down and refocusing on how we can make that work because it is one of those mm-hmm. things where I feel like a lot of our people are there. They are right? yeah. it's a matter of making that yeah. work now, kind of moving along the same line here. So we've analyzed online. We were having conversations in person. You were talking about something I think is really important, which is split testing, figuring out what's working, going back to the drawing board. I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've asked this question to a lot of people before, and I want to see what your response would be. 
-hmm. because I feel like you're like me and that you want to like AB test and like go back and reiterate and try new things and kind of really Mm -hmm. dig as deep as possible. Like I want to get in the the mind and the shoes of my, my consumer, right? Like that's, that's the level that I want to get to. So how do you know, other than just a gut feel when your offer is just not the right offer or that you haven't dug deep enough yet? Uh, well, first of all, is it generating ROI, positive ROI, right? Sure. But you should always see, I always be split testing. Like that's my mantra because, you know, years ago I used to run a lot of traffic to offers and own my own stuff. And it's to me, it's like, if you don't split test, how do you know if something's working? No, sure. Like I, I've done these big, like consulted with, I could name some major, major brands where I'm like, oh, great. You're doing this campaign. You're spending million dollar a, you know, a day. Right. What's your split test look like? Are what? And I'm oh, like, Jesus. well, we have a 2% conversion rate. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, is that good? And I'm like, I don't know. Have you split test? Because what if you have five on another campaign yeah. or, or one on another? I, it's impossible to say. You always, always have to split test whatever you're doing. Because otherwise, how do you know if it's working? You don't. You don't know if there's something better out there because you haven't tested it against something else. So always, let's say you start at a 0.2% conversion rate, right? You mm-hmm. split test, blah, blah, blah. You have, now you have 1%, then you have 8%. You struck gold i don't care keep split testing what if there's a 12 percenter out there what if there's a 30 percenter out there always always split test always yeah well a lot of people are making determinations about their product and they're pivoting and moving away from a product which i think is a great product offering or service offering simply because what you just said they put together something call it's called a funnel right and there's no split test within their funnel yep and they're making a determination based on that one funnel off of that one ad copy off of that one sales page, off of that exactly. one cart. Oh my God, yeah. There's, there's four or five different opportunities just within that to split test all of those various aspects. And if you've, I would say if you've done your homework enough to have those conversations, you should know, hey, I've got a, I, have a, I have conviction that this is a valid offer because I've had these conversations, which is why you start at the top level of having the conversations and understanding your demographic before you get to the split testing. Because if you just start split testing stuff and yeah. you don't know if there's a viable market, what are you doing? Yeah. Exactly. Here's a funny example. So six, five or six years ago, I was consulting for a health and beauty company, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Pretty small guys. And they were doing about, I'd say, 250 to 300,000 a month um, in in revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, uh, how much are you spending on traffic? You know, and they're like, oh, not a lot. Because we just kept losing money. It doesn't work. And I'm like, doesn't work. Like, okay, who, you know, did you split test the ads? And they're like, what, what are you talking about? So I slowly convinced them to start, you know, spending some money on buying traffic, mm. uh, you know, optimizing the funnel and all that stuff. But so, you know, the first 50 K they only made like 15 K back. And he's like furious. I'm like, dude, you, you got to spend some money to learn. You got to gather some data here so we Which can is, see what yeah. we're doing. And he's furious. He almost wants to cut it off. And I'm like, no, I can guarantee you this is going to work, you know? And three months later, they're getting $2 million in sales a month. Six months later, they're doing $8 million a month. Dude, that's insane. This is Facebook advertisement? Uh, well, it's a mix of media buying and Facebook, yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Wow, I was wondering, I was wondering yeah. as you were talking where, where you primarily focus your efforts on advertising. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, uh, if I were to advertise something today, I'd, Facebook, first of all. Sure. Because you can target it. It's so ridiculous. Much. It's, it's, it's a cheat code. It's a cheat code. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. target to people's specific interests, age mm. groups, whatever, right? Yeah. And I'm meticulous. When I target, I run ads. If, I, if my target demographic is 18 to 35, I run one ad for every year. One ad for 18-year-olds, one ad really? for 19-year-olds. Oh, yeah. I go down, I split test, one ad, I, I'll split test cities, I'll split test different languages. Because once you find those that really hit it, that's, I mean, you're looking at, I mean, we've had campaigns that does thousands of percent ROI just because we've been that meticulous. Because the way you speak to someone who's 18 or 19 versus someone that's 30 is very, very different. Oh, 100%. If you want to na- narrow it down, right? So when you're doing specific age groups, like for example, you know, uh, what have I done in the past? That's kind of like a uh, cell phone, like when you have ring signals and all that stuff, or uh, you can say, Hey, for the people that just turned 18, this is a great song, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, and then you're like, Oh, I'm 18. That's great. Mm-hmm. I want to click it. And I can see 
because then I can narrow it down and run broader ads. Because if I know the interest from 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, and I see that, well, it's just the 22 and the 23 year olds that are really interested in this, well, cut off all the other 80, 20 rule, right? You know, if 20% of your spend should generate 80% of your ROI. So, but not do a broad range and then look to see with your analytics to see who's engaging with it and then niche it down. You're saying do that first and then go broad. That's a, a bit different than what I've seen people do before. That's exactly. interesting. Yeah, it is different because, well, you can go, when we talk about broad, I don't like going super broad. I can sure. go broad as within like, let's say, three to four years in an age, or 18 to 22, okay. 22 to 25, You're not going to like 25 to 45. You're oh, not going to do that. No. Interesting. No. Interesting. No. Because people are, I mean, someone who's 25 was, you know, what? No, different out, language. Of, out of college for your know, junior yeah. position. Someone who's 45, maybe an executive at a company handling million dollar budgets, have kids, have, you know, wife or husband or whatever. Uh, completely different lives are being led here. Even if you're 18 and 25, because when you're 18, you're just out of high school. You don't know anything about life. You know, the world's at your feet and you're, you're a rock star, whatever you do. Right. And then you're yeah. 25 reality kind of hits, <laughs> you know, you got a job or you're, you've, you've failed at a couple of projects and now you're maybe you've gotten, you know, it's just, you got to talk to them in very different languages. Even in some of the ad copy that I've written, um, because you, you know, now I think one of the hard things is, getting people to resonate with your copy, given that there's so much saturation of ads in the market, right? Oh, so like you really have to cause some kind of pattern disruption and gather their yeah. attention long enough to be able to speak to them in any kind of meaningful way. And so I try to infuse a lot of aspects of my, per and this is different for me because with me being a personal brand now with what I primarily do um, and selling info products, it's mm -hmm. entirely different than what I would be doing if I was selling some kind of like, service for a big organization right like absolutely now not to say you completely strip your personality out of it like i think you mm -hmm. still have a message that mm -hmm. is conducive to the culture of your organization but for yep. me just being an individual i can speak to my personality way more than i could as an organization right so absolutely. i try to infuse jokes and like elements of my yeah. personality but here's the thing to some whether it's male or female it's gonna ring differently right yep. it's gonna yep. hit, it's gonna land differently but mm -hmm. also some of my some of my my references like pop references within my ad which i've done before now yep. only resonate with a certain age demographic absolutely that's similar to my own but the people that are young they don't even know what the hell the reference is and the people that are older they're too far removed to know what it is either exactly yeah. exactly if you're making a joke with ellie goulding or uh you know justin bieber and, and you're trying to market to a 45 year old group it's, it's just yeah it's just it's gonna a, work. A, yeah it's not yeah, relevant. it's not gonna work mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right in that, you know? So what kind of campaigns, and I'm assuming there's a, there's a, if you go, if you're like us, which I assume you are in that there's a lot of different in terms of what you're optimizing for, whether it's lead gen, whether it's direct to sale, mm -hmm. what kind of, or whether it's even like, you know, just general retargeting warm audience, what are you, what are your primary or what do you recommend somebody that's not running Facebook ads that they get started with just to see some kind of windfall or traction. Cause it does. I think that's the biggest thing that I underestimated was how much you really have to invest in training your pixel, how much you have to invest in, in just understanding how to market. Cause I think a lot of people start and then they stop and they're like, Oh, it doesn't work. They had the experience that work. you, you no. had. Oh, this, this Facebook stuff is blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work. Worthless. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So where do you recommend that somebody get started? Just basic list building type efforts or what traffic generation? It yeah, I mean, you know, if you're getting started with running traffic uh, or, or selling stuff online, first of all, read up a little bit on copywriting, right? Yes. You know, learn how to write some good copy. Uh, yeah. Learn how to talk to people or learn how to communicate. Because um, that'll teach you how to really hit, you got to hit the problem that people have. You got to get them over the pain point. You got to understand sales because selling in person or selling online. Oh. And I know, I know people always want that. Well, 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 no, no, no. Where do you buy your traffic from? And what's the ad supposed to say? But, yeah. but Hey, listen to this. The same like, Oh, you know, uh, how do you date someone or how do you do this? It's, okay. Let's, let's talk about the, you know, the overview, the, what you need to learn first, right? Mm. Or you can't just learn, learn how to put windows into a house. No, let's, let's, build the foundation of the house first. And that foundation is understanding a sales process. Mm. What is a sales process like? Well, somebody has a problem. You got to make that problem really imminent and you got to make it really urgent for them to solve. You got to make it hurt and then you got to offer the solution, right? 
Mm. Uh, you learn that if you're doing it online with text, of course, you need to learn a little bit of storytelling. You need to learn how to write copy. Then you can start looking at, okay, well, where do I get my traffic from? Uh, where do I buy traffic? How do I convert it? What's the funnels like, et cetera, et cetera. Set up a Shopify store, whatever, I don't care. If you're not running Facebook ads, I mean, again, you can buy ads of, a, uh, you know, do ad buying off of a ton of different sites. There's, there's a million, you can buy ads from Google, you can buy ads, you know, Bing, highly underestimated Interesting. Uh, traffic source. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not running a ton of traffic, uh, you know, at the moment, but, but, uh, you know, there's, I always negotiated with websites that I knew my, uh, target audience hung out at. Yeah. So if they hang out on, you know, I don't know, whatever Forbes or, or some blogger or whatever, I negotiate with their ad team. Hey, I need to have an ad running, you know, and it depends on your budgets as well, of course. But, yeah, sure. But, you know, uh, another option is, of course, go find affiliates to sell it for you. Mm -hmm. That's that's the best option in my mind, because that's that's how we did with a ton of the products we launched, because uh, the only risk that's there is that you only pay per performance. Right. So when you sell, you pay. Now you pay more than what you would pay when you're uh, running traffic or optimized traffic yourself. But it's a good way of getting started. Hey, my product is. 20 bucks, I'll pay someone 10 bucks to sell it. Somebody already knows how to run traffic. And these are physical that. products you're talking about with affiliates? Oh, you can do info or products services. too. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, services, uh, not so, so it's much. It's a little bit tougher, right? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that with services. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but to me, I, again, it depends on what you're doing. Like, oh, Sam, how are you getting so many consulting gigs with all these big brands? I want to do that too. Okay, sure. But I also have a decade or more experience worth of, you know, consulting with big brands. And I can use that in a pitch. How did I get started? Personal branding, right? You got to get featured, get yourself featured because you got to establish credibility out there. If you have an article in Forbes or an Inc or whatever, men's health, fitness, whatever your thing is, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have some credibility. Oh, you were featured in that, that, and that, that must mean you're, you're kind of legit. Right. And then we can talk about what can you offer? Uh, it's just, but again, it's just about, it's about selling. It's about you know, pinpointing their problem, understanding their problem, and then offering a solution. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to do. And, you know, I have a thousand no's to, you know, a hundred yeses, you know, that's just how it is. Handle rejection well. Go out there. Don't be afraid of failing. The same with buying traffic. I know I kind of went on a tangent here from you. No, it was great buying traffic but i think you know it's 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 all about implementing and doing and testing it's impossible to say should i buy traffic from bing or google or facebook i don't yeah. know what yeah, do you, you just do? don't know yeah you and know? it's never in my experience too sometimes it's never the one that you expect is going to do well right oh like exactly even, like even even uh we we're testing one of my cart layouts and, yeah. and I'm like, I don't like this one at all. Like, I love yeah. this other one. And the one that I didn't like personally is the no. one that outperformed the other one like 10 times yes. over. I mean, it wasn't no. even close. Let the market decide, man. It's pretty wild. It's yeah. pretty wild. And I think that's, I think that's also something, um, God, what, what book was, it? I think it was, I think it was, this is marketing. I'm, uh, we're reading it in my, my book club this month. This is marketing by Seth Godin. And uh -huh. he talks about, which I think was a really valuable lesson, man, that I had to learn the hard way. Um, was he was talking about the the I don't remember the guy's name the guy that took over J C Penney as CEO in 2011 and like drove yep. the company into the toilet yeah and the reason being was effectively that he turned it being coming from Apple I think it was Apple mm -hmm. or, yeah I think it was Apple I think so yeah uh, yeah he came over and wanted to create the same experience right of like what you have at Apple which is entirely yeah. different market and what he yes. stripped away and didn't realize is mm -hmm. he made something that he preferred not yes. what his general consumer wanted exactly and their whole thing was they like shopping at jc penny because they felt like they were winning when they yeah. got a good deal and when he mm -hmm. took that away mm -hmm. stripped the entire main incentive for, for jc penny shoppers and almost yep. The company. yep exactly so it's and sometimes i think that people sorry i've cut you off like four times man I'm no, no, talk. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good <laughs> um, but i think sometimes people craft products designs sales pages carts to cater to what they like absolutely. not to what their market likes absolutely and that's the biggest one of the biggest mistakes you can make 
Right. You know, let the market decide. Yes. You don't decide for the market. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. People, you know, hey, I'm all about encouraging entrepreneurs. I'm all about, oh, sure, you want to make a billion, you want to become a billionaire, go for it, dude. I believe in you. But, mm -hmm. you know, everybody, well, Apple, you know, did their own thing. Yes and no, because the market wanted what they created, yes. right? They, now they created that want, but they have smart people that see where the market is going and mm -hmm. what's possible with technology. Um, but if you're an entrepreneur that doesn't start with Apple money, you know, uh, give the market what it wants. Look yeah. for who's doing well in the market. How can you do it better? Mm -hmm. How can you steal a little market share? Because to me, as, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, as someone who, um, at least in the beginning, wanted to make a living and you know pay bills by not working for someone else, uh, it's go where the money is. Everybody's like, oh no, don't go into the health, like health you know, nutrition space. It's so saturated. That's great. People are spending billions of dollars every year on marketing, and all I have to do is pick up a magazine and see exactly what they're doing. Because if that ad has been running yeah. for six months, it means it's making money. How can I do it better? Right. Do you see what I mean? Like, I don't need to spend $100 million on ads. I don't need... It's I so just, funny to watch people's what works. response. It's so funny to watch people's responses to competition because in their minds, um, if anybody, and I've seen this many times, maybe you've seen it as yeah. well, but you talk to a young entrepreneur that they have this wonderful, brilliant idea. And of they course. think that they're the first person that thought of it. And I'm like, oh, of course, bro, it's 2019, right? Yeah. <laughs> All the new ideas have been out on the table yeah. by now, yeah. right? We haven't, yeah. we maybe don't have the technology to deploy them in the manner that you envision it, but the yeah. idea has already been thought, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and the first thing they do is do a quick Google search and see that, that it already exists or somebody's yeah. already doing it. And they're like, oh, well, give that's it. it. Moving yeah. on to the next one. And it's like, dude, they have validated the market for you. Exactly. They've created the customers for you and they've shown you how they've done it. They've left a, a, a trail of crumbs for you exactly that's uh, i mean competition is so healthy yeah saturated market great let me go in and take a small piece of that and i'll be fine yeah. financially yeah. oh you know to me it's like pioneers get shot right that's just those are the guys that end up with an arrow in their back right yeah. so so i'm like it's true let someone else go in and, and get shot and then i can do, come in and do it better because yeah. i mean look at most of these you know the big companies they became this big because someone else started trailblazing, right? They right, were the pioneers. Right. And then someone came in and like, all right, I'm going to make this, I'm going to do this for real. I'm going to do this right. much better. Uh, and that's how you do it. Alta Vista wasn't good enough. So Google came around. MySpace. MySpace wasn't good enough. So Facebook came around. You see? And it's like. What, what were some of the other the music Blockbuster. Ones? Lime, Blockbuster, Jesus. Yeah. LimeWire. Or, you know, or what was the yeah. other one? Um, Napster. Napster. All these things, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, and these all failed, you know, orders. I mean, they all failed because they didn't adapt to technology and they didn't change into what their consumers wanted. So how are you, this is totally off the cuff and out of left field, but how are you, because <laughs> you've talked about you like disruptive markets and you're, yeah. you're playing around in blockchain, dude. So first of all, 99% of people, probably more, don't even understand how the hell blockchain fully works. Right. Um, so how are you playing in such a disruptive market and being that pioneer, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And still making sure that you are the first to market that does also succeed and you don't become an Napster or MySpace. Right. Very good question. So I think there, there's a couple of things here at play because while disrupting with a new technology, we're tackling an old and existing problem. Okay. So... Pioneering new technology, sure, but not pioneering a new industry. Like we didn't create something out of thin air. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's one of the oldest industries on this planet. It's also one of the largest industries on this planet, right? The global revenue is about $14 trillion, right? So mm -hmm. it's a massive market and it's facing the same challenges wherever you go and whoever you talk to. What, so there are already solutions out there. What we're doing is we're just doing it better. We're utilizing technology and innovation to do it better. But the problem solving is already out there. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, so while it is pioneering in usage of the technology, I don't feel like it's, it's you know, we're not coming up with problems that didn't exist before or we're not, sure. we're just solving them in a way that others haven't thought of before. Interesting. So, so, how, do, so how does it work with what you guys are doing then? 
Cause I was confused. I mean, not confused. I'm curious about what you guys do cause it's logistics and, and transportation, correct? Yes, exactly. So today in today's climate in this huge industry, uh-huh. uh, there, it has a lot of problems, this industry, right? So think about it. Every, everything you have from the ring on your finger to your glasses and your road mics or your house, whatever, everything is there because it was transported there somehow, right? Sure. The things move around all the time. Right. It's, you know, it's 10% of the G- U.S. GDP is transport and logistics. Mm. It's pretty amazing. That so, is amazing. Yeah. So if you look at it, the problems here are, one, there's, there's a ton of, uh, well, theft. Just in, the, just in the U.S. alone, there's more than $30 billion worth of theft and fraud every year, right? Jesus. And that's because of centralized solutions. It's not guys running into warehouses like, give me all your stuff. No, no, no. (laughs) No, no, no. It's not Wild Wild West. Yeah, I get that. Right, right. Exactly. It's because (laughs) there's an administrator that handles a centralized solution where I go in and say, oh, you got 10 containers? Well, here's five grand. Why don't you just make it nine, right? Mm. Administrator makes it nine. Tenth is gone. It's on my truck, of course, but nobody knows it anymore. Uh, yeah, and you it fell can, off the truck, right? Right, right. It fell off the truck. Exactly. Now, there's a couple of other problems. Visibility is a big problem. Look at temperature handling, for example, right? If you're a pharmaceutical company or a food and beverage company, we've seen a ton of recalls, beef, chicken, produce, all this, you know, all the lettuce, all these things that are recalls because, you know, there's something that's wrong along the way in the supply chain. Now, mm. what does blockchain help with here? And what, how does it work? And I get all these questions all the time. Sure. Well, first of all, how does it help? Well, there's two key words that blockchain technology has that's so important for transport logistics, fintech, health insurance, whatever it is that you're doing on the blockchain. And it's provenance and immutability, right? Mm. We can talk about decentralization. We can talk about all that stuff. But what it all really comes down to, in my opinion, is provenance. You can prove and trace uh, data Mm. all the way back to its true original source wow. in an immutable environment, meaning nobody has tampered with the data. And you know so because every single step is logged. And in a blockchain, it's as close to impossible as you can get to hack, right? Mm. So that's the really important thing. So imagine we're transporting a clinical trial somewhere, you know, a pharmaceutical company. We need to show that uh, the sensors that we pick in from, uh, temperature information and GPS information from, Mm -hmm. we need to show that the temperature has been held throughout the whole supply chain, uh, all the way to, you know, delivery. Now, we also need to know that that temperature, the data hasn't been altered. Mm. Very important. It's a clinical trial. People might die, right? Or it's a vaccine or whatever it is. Uh, Same with food. We need to know that the food has held a certain temperature throughout the whole supply chain. Um, or if it's, let's say, high value products, we need to know the GPS locations, et cetera. But we also know there is no administrator that can alter that data. There was 10 containers coming in. You couldn't pay me. You could come into our office with a billion dollars in cash and jewelry and mm-hmm. ask me, Sam, please change this to nine containers instead of 10. And I can't do it because mm-hmm. it's immutable. That's the beauty of blockchain. But where are those data points being inputted, though, throughout the process? So good question. So we hope to rely mostly on sensors, right? Okay. So the, the GPS trackers also, um, in our case, tracks temperature. Uh, if the container has been opened, uh, it can ch- track humidity, etc. right? So the sensor logs information that we save, you know, checkpoints to the blockchain to make sure that uh, nothing has been altered. Mm. Uh, so that's how we can now people always ask me that. Oh, so you're saying blockchain prevents theft. That's great. No, it doesn't prevent theft at all. It's not going to send out a robot no, and go get your container, but we can pinpoint where it happened. Track it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we can track t- where did the temperature excursion happen? Right. Or where is your stuff right now? I mean, it's just incredible mm. how I've talked to, you know, companies doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year on pen and paper or Excel sheets. And they don't know where their stuff is. Mm. Literally, they don't know. They're like, oh, if the customer calls, you know, two weeks late and says the stuff isn't here, then we know it's not there. And I'm like, we, we experienced something like that firsthand. And I, I actually, I have a couple of intros I could provide for you because they could really utilize this. It's yeah, thank you so much. $100, yeah. $100 million companies, man. Yeah. $100 million plus companies. Yeah. 
um, that we ended up as a startup in our third year in business, mm -hmm. ended up basically having to take over their entire shipment and logistic manifest. We were wow. having to plan their entire delivery schedule because internally they couldn't do it. Right. And we're talking millions of dollars worth of, in this case, it was furniture, millions yeah. of dollars worth of furniture coming from overseas. And they yep. had no idea what was at the building. And moreover, get this, get this. We discovered that, so all of a sudden furniture was disappearing and we couldn't, <laughs> and, and, and I had, this is crazy, it's going to blow your mind because this was before blockchain, but yeah. I had yeah. the idea. I said, we need to put QR codes on every single piece of furniture yep. so that we can actually document that it was placed in there and have kind of a manifesto of where it is, right? So, it's mm -hmm. been, so we know it's been delivered because mm -hmm. the entire system that they were relying on, millions of dollars worth of inventory was basically having someone from the property or, you know, uh, that was part of like, you know, a general contractor, whoever mm -hmm. was there that was in charge on site, come mm -hmm. through and sign off on something. But here's the deal on an interim basis from that point of, of actually delivering the furniture and, and putting it in a room, mm -hmm. getting a signature. Sometimes we discovered where stuff was disappearing. And I was like, there's something wrong here. Right. And mm -hmm. we were being held accountable for it as the people right. that were doing the installation aspect of things. Mm -hmm. I'm walking down the hallway, just kind of doing investigations, dude, they were, they were these storage closets on every single floor. They were stashing furniture in there basically to say because they made an ordering issue they didn't order enough to finish the building so they were trying to push that blame off to get the furniture they actually needed for free oh wow and had i not had a door not been been partially open to where i could see it mm -hmm. we would have been on the hook for it and they were trying to take that out of our contract and i already had a ton of sunk costs like hundred thousand dollars in labor wow. costs, and i would have been eating it big time if i hadn't found yep. that so i had the idea wow. like guys we're not doing this anymore so yep. this some yep. sort of sensor, which in, in, in this day, the iteration of that in 2013 was like a QR code or something. Right, uh, right, right. Yep. So, man, it is a big problem, and I've experienced it firsthand. So, I can definitely, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're we're talking to, I mean, we're talking to, you know, the biggest companies in the world, and yeah. they don't have enough insight into their supply chain. It's crazy, man. And I'm not, yeah, it's crazy. And it's I'm not saying too. they're they're incompetent. It's just no, no, no. It's, it's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. It's it's a very complex issue. Uh, in the way it's been built, but this is this is technology. Again, it's not the one and all. You know, God sends solution to all your logistics problems no, no, or sure. whatever other industries right. is being used in. But but it's really, I really believe that blockchain will well not only change the world, but uh, for transport and logistics, it's it's going to make a significant change. And now you can, it has I mean, to. It's, been, it's been validated now. I mean, you got IBM, Samsung, Oracle. Amazon, like all these guys are coming in with blockchains now for specifically for supply chain, right? So, so it's like, okay, we're on to something here, you know? Very fascinating. Great. Yeah. Cool, man. So if somebody's listening to this and they're in that, they're in that space, right? They're in logistics space. Um, is there a way that they can get in touch with you guys? Cause I'd hate to not provide, you know, we gave a lot of value and talked about what you guys are doing. And I think it's a tremendous solution. And as I mentioned, I've experienced it firsthand and it's a real thing, yeah. right? Um, so is there a way people get in touch with you or the way they could follow up with what you guys are doing with that? Cause that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Just go to ship chain. So S H I P and chain C H A I N dot I O ship chain dot I O. Uh, okay. it's all there. You can, you know, you can fill out and request for demo. You can talk to our team or me or, you know, uh, yeah, it's right there. Sweet bro. Now. Yep. Hey man, I, I just, I just looked at the questions we initially outlined and we didn't talk about <laughs> any of that at all. So, right. <laughs> uh, but anyways, man, it was good. I love when it just goes organic and we talk about real cool stuff and, and yeah, stuff same here, man. Same here. Here, dude. So, yeah. um, so I enjoyed it, man. I appreciate you hanging out with me as long as you have. Oh, and, uh, oh, pleasure is mine, man. Yeah. I look forward to, I look forward to tracking what you guys are up to, man. I think it's really cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate you having me on here and you know, thank you for your time and it's great. Great conversation. All right, brother. Take care, man. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.